Thank you very much for that, because I'm often reluctant to speak about my time in Antarctica. I loved it so much that I get homesick when I talk about it. And for the last several years, I've been really careful about not living my life in the rearview mirror. But a couple things have happened to change my mind. The possibility of becoming a spacefaring species has receded from the stuff of dreams to the stuff of achievable goal. And in the process of figuring out how to achieve that goal, scientists have turned to the Antarctic winter over experience as a source of understanding the psychological pressures and stresses that people will face in long duration spaceflight. And because I work professionally in aerospace, I'm often exposed to this thinking. And because I wintered over, I'm often asked about it. I find much of the research to be insightful. Donna Oliver's work comes to mind. But some of it I read and I go, this doesn't track my winter experience at all or my experience leading the station. And so perhaps all these many years later, there is one last leadership duty that remains for me to perform. Perhaps I am still standing to watch, and perhaps I am supposed to speak in public on this one topic. Concerns about the psychological stresses that winter over expeditions face aren't new or unjustified. This is the Belgica. It was the first expedition to winter over in the Antarctic latitudes, and it notoriously did not go well. The captain became despondent and depressed and retreated to his cabin for most of the expedition. Many members of the crew suffered from depression and scurvy, but a few thrived and they helped the others until the ship freed itself from the ice and returned home. The types of psychological stresses that winter over expeditions face aren't limited to the extreme environment and the physiological effects thereof. There's the loneliness of being separated from home. There's the rigid and strict work environment and the lack of autonomy. And there's the occasional disruptive, life-threatening interruption. So in the early history of Arctic and Antarctic expeditions, there are numerous examples of winter over expeditions wherein the crew or individual members thereof suffered some type of psychological dysfunction. I've given you three examples here, but there are others. So it's no wonder that winter overs like me have to undergo a battery of tests to prove our psychological fitness. Or that psychologists and other scientists would want to know and understand the sources of psychological stress and how to mitigate them and how they manifest. But I fear we've taken this very reasonable line of inquiry and this accumulated history of expeditions and morphed it into an overly dramatic and overly anxious tale. One that depicts the winter over cruise as chronically depressed and constantly embattled by psychological stress. And that the mitigation to this is to search for and find that perfect psychological Adonis that perfect personality that's ideal for wintering over or ideal for long duration space flights. I do not concur with these notions. And on behalf of my crew and myself, I also find much of what published science has to say about us to be inaccurate. Here's one example from a Navy psychologist of the kind of thing I'm talking about. When I am asked, if you want to be 100% sure that a person will adjust to Antarctic duty, what do you look for? My usual answer is that I look for somebody who loves their work. Okay, as the former boss, I want to support that one. But he continues, however, it is not quite right because you do not get to work all the time down there. There are other times that you have to fill. If I were going to look for somebody who I would be 100% certain would adjust, that person would be dull. 
boring to me. What is actually required in remote duty is to be able to watch the same movie six or eight or 10 times in a row and not feel the least bit uncomfortable about it. We can and do send interesting people, and they can and do adjust. He sounds a little surprised. But if you want to be 100% certain that they would adjust well, you would choose people who were very dull. Now, I think you could see why I might object to that one. <laughs> this person has never seen The Princess Bride, a movie you cannot watch too many times. <laughs> But seriously, this is a picture of all the things you can do in McMurdo in a week, all organized by the people who live there. Look, doing psychological screening to identify people who have some kind of psychosocial pathology that might be disruptive is just pragmatic and necessary. But that's a far cry from suggesting and then proposing a methodology to look for a specific personality or personality type. As a leader, I can tell you that lots of different types of personalities can succeed. As a leader, I can also share with you that I know the sources of psychological stress, and many of them I can see their results and mitigate in real time. None of which is to say that personal behaviors aren't important quite the contrary, but I do believe they're a matter of choice. You may or may not find me to be dull once you get to know me, but I may have to elect behaviors that make me appear dull to others. There is no way, as the leader, I should be drinking in a bar at night. I never know when my pager's going to go off or why. That leads to an important insight that maybe success in these extreme environments isn't a function of personality or personality type at all. As any graduate of Knowles or Outward Bound or any other outdoor education or leadership school can tell you, the behaviors you need to succeed in an expeditionary environment or a remote situation can be learned and acquired, and hence, they can be taught. They even have a formal name the complete compendium of which is called an expeditionary attitude, or EBs if you prefer. Here is one small example of one cornerstone expeditionary behavior that I thought was so simple yet brilliant at the time. I ran and took a picture of it off my TV. It's like minus 50 something, and the wind chill is like minus 70 something, and the briefer's not sugarcoating anything here, but take a look at that last sentence. That is a perfect example of the what the hey, just roll with it attitude. That's a cornerstone of expeditionary behavior. To understand the power of this, what if the briefer had changed the last sentence to read, it's going to be a tough work day out there, folks. What would have been the impact on everyone's disposition and attitude throughout the workday? What if that accumulated across an entire season? As you can see, winter overs aren't an abstract concept. They are real people. The ones in this photograph happen to be your fellow Americans. Uh, here, at the beginning of the season, we didn't know what lay in front of us, but I can tell you now. We had a tsunami. We were in a constant struggle all winter long to keep the power up and running. We did a 30-mile trek across the sea ice to restore our communications to the outside world, and we did a medevac or two besides. And throughout all of that, I never heard them say, not my job, or it can't be done. This photograph is the first returning flight at the beginning of summer. This photograph and the previous one are the bookends of an entire winter season. And in the distance between those two photographs, the Winter Rover crew rebuilt that much needed power plant, fixed an ice pier, repaired and refurbished hundreds if not thousands of pieces of equipment needed for the upcoming summer season, and fed, housed, and kept each other safe. They were a competent, highly motivated and productive crew. So, if we are going to use wintering over in Antarctica as a paradigm or an instructional lesson 
and how to live and work in outer space. I think it's important that we focus as much on the mechanisms by which they succeed under those psychological stresses as we do on the psychological maladaptations. And I think the people who winter over in Antarctica succeed because they adopt a known set of identifiable, teachable, and learnable behaviors. There's some of this research in the literature, but whether it's to come from psychology or anthropology or sociology, there needs to be more of it. And a failure to do so overstates our psychological vulnerabilities and understates our psychological strengths and may foreclose us from all that's possible in this brand new era. Thank you very much for listening. Excellent, Dean. I know.